for the need for prayer. And Chris, we've learned that we can't force things to happen. We tried to force a, a well in the street before. And it wasn't happening. It just it, it wasn't working. But now we have two men of God coming to us and they're putting together a plan for a prayer team. Another prayer team. A prayer team that comes together one of the things that we absolutely will need to have at that point is anyone who wants to join them. And there'll be more about that as, as, as they, those things come together. But here's the other thing. They want to right now pray for you. And there's a lot of, if you open up your bulletin, it's full of prayers. Most of these in here are friends and family that probably don't have any contact information for them. So if you could, Casey, you want to stand up? Because Casey's really been after me. I told him I was going to get as many phone numbers or email addresses as I possibly could. So if if you have a prayer request in here, or you're putting in a prayer request in, please put a phone number or an email address or some way for us to get a hold of you. Probably a phone number. Because what we'd like, we would like to have happen in this case, he's put it on his heart, and I know he's done this with a few people that he has been able to get hold of. He wants to call you up. He wants to pray with you over the phone. Literally, so you know that Casey and his wife sent him one time. And his wife did. This month, I've been out of our house seven weeks. And this is quite the time. Casey and his wife have also uh, stood up to stay in for us and take care of you. Okay, the last time they have to stand. Well, we are coming. Yeah, okay. So I'm not going to mention anything. I'm going to mention one, two more things. Um, what that Connie and Chris and Nita just want to no, 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 I don't. I don't do that. Two more things. There's ways to connect with us. Social media, our website, email. Uh, get on our prayer list so you can also pray. But that information's in there. So do that. But today, two opportunities to get out in the community and pray. We're split up today. We are split up. Chris will be at Not two, <laughs> 2 o'clock today. Chris is going to be at Redmond Park and for the South of Islands. That happens every month. And that's what, 2 to 8? It's a long, it's a, it's a good long day, but they'll be there. And something I've noticed, I take the third avenue to work when I leave church in the morning. There's been a group of people standing in a giant circle holding hands at Redmond Park every day this past week. Yes. So there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of people that want to take back that neighborhood. Yes. And here's the other thing that's going on today. From 4 to 5 o'clock at Green Square Park. The new Green Square Park. You haven't seen it. It's absolutely gorgeous. And they're going to break up that Pokemon stuff for a while. Yeah, break up Pokemon stuff. <laughs> Um, Bridge Haven. Our friends at Bridge Haven are getting together for a prayer vigil to pray for those uh, babies who have not yet been born yet. For the babies who weren't born. For people who have been through an abortion. Men and women. Because it affects the men just as much as it affects the women. Maybe not physically for the men, but emotionally. And guys maybe not ready to admit to that. But we're going to be there from 4 to 5 praying. We're going to be praying that we can stand up and take a stance for life. Amen. She got a lot of... I see Kelly over here. She's not in her head. Because Kelly, you're going to be there. I know you will. So join us today for that. If you can make it for part of Tell you what, go to Redmond Park. And get lunch too. Free lunch, free rides for the yeah. kids, bouncy rides, music. Breaks down the Green Square Park for an hour and then yeah. go to Redmond Park. But join us today yeah. because I'm in the house. Oh. Because prayer is so incredibly important. And now, before we move on, let's pray. Because we need to pray for some special people today. There's a group of people today that are getting baptized. That's why there's a big white in there. We give all praise, honor, and glory to you, Father, because we are right now praying for those folks, those people who are in front of you and their church family and their world, are declaring their faith for you, Father, saying that you are the Lord of their hearts, and that you are, will be now allowed to transform them through your Holy Spirit to become your children as we lower them into the water so that we can 
signified Jesus' death, and then raised them up again as Jesus was risen from the dead. Father, we thank you for these people that are giving their lives over to you today. And Lord, we know this is just the second, or actually the third of many baptisms, of many changed lives yes. in this ministry, Father, that you have ordained, Father God. We have all praise on our glory today, Father, in Jesus' name, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Let's say that to everyone. <laughs>
just come forward, please, and take the offering today.
neljämissä kuvaa. No se ei ole. So, the message today is avoiding prayer. How appropriate. We're going to look at what God has to say about avoiding prayer. Not what Chris and Terry has to say about. We hear a lot today about burnout. But check it out, there's a lot of different kinds. There's emotional burnout, relational burnout. But it's not a new issue. In fact, there's many examples in the Bible. And one of them being in 1 Kings chapter 19. And it's about life. Remember the story in 1 Kings, some of you, that where he had this great miracle happen from God. They had this God contest kind of on Mount Carmel where God sent his fire down and the whole nation kind of turned back to God from it. And really what kind of what happened is they killed all the false prophets. And that was kind of, that was really fun for life that there. You can see when that happened, you guys. Pay attention. That was a real huge emotional honor. Right? So, follow me. It was this big, huge miracle. So, there was this big emotional high. So, follow me now to scene two. That was scene one. Scene two in the next chapter, the first king. There's this queen named Desmos. It's kind of a wicked queen. She gets very this makes her highly upset. So she puts a death threat out on a lot of And sends a messenger to tell him that she's planning to kill him. So this wicked queen sends this dude to tell Elijah that she's coming. That really sends the message that she put a death threat out. Just a few days after this enormous miracle where this whole nation turns back to God. So a lot of time, when I'm sorry, his life across the desert, he says, I'm out of here. And he hides in this cave in fear, saying, God, please kill me, take my life. You see, because Elijah is afraid of this. So what's going on? Well, this is a classic example of burn. Now, this is kind of the behavior of the Heavy wire because after every mountain top there's a valley. Following? After every high there's a low. And with success, even success of stress. And that word stress, home stress, more important, spiritual stress. The good news is the Bible tells us Elijah was just like us. We're no different. He was a human being. He wasn't supernatural. God used him in some miraculous ways, but he was just a normal dude. And so we can kind of see it in the life of a normal dude. We can see the cause of the signs of burnout and the cure for burnout. We may not need this message today. You're thinking, and if you don't, congratulations. But you may see. Or I guarantee there's something in your life that's a big, big easy. Somebody you know going through emotional burnout. But this is one of those messages that you can hold on to. Because someday you may go through it and have a dark day or a period that you burn. So pull out the outline and read with me. And this is what God had to say. Here's some signs of burnout. You ready? What are the signs of burnout? Well, we see them in Elijah's life, and when you see them in your life, you know you're headed in the wrong direction. One, we depreciate our worth. Here's a big sign of burnout. We put ourselves down mentally. There's a little tape going on in your mind saying, no, we're no, we're no good. I haven't achieved. I'm nobody. I gotta lose a job. My life doesn't matter. I don't count. I'm insignificant. I have no value. You just beat yourself up. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, if you don't have a Bible and you want to just, just 
skateboarder should be one in front of them. If not, look down, look left, look right, look up, look down, you know, go you know, something you want. So in Elijah, from 1 Kings 19, 4, Elijah came to a broom tree, he sat down under it, he prayed, take my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. So you see here, he's comparing himself to his ancestors and saying, I'm no better than those guys. And that one of the first causes of burnout is comparing yourself. When you start comparing yourself to someone else, you're setting yourself up for the motion. What you tend to do is compare your life with the accomplishments of other people. I've done that. Who has? I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing good enough. He's got a better ride than I do. Let me tell you, it's just better. If you see someone that says, I don't do that, I'm not totally content. Content is all they're just hiding. They're better at it. You compare your talents and your gifts and think how eager they are compared to the superstar quality of the person next door. I'll give you an example. They used to love me when I couldn't figure something out on the computer and I'd spend an hour to tear it apart over and go, oh. And I look at it. And Jesus. <laughs> And Jesus, I say thank you, Dean. And he walked out and put the book down. I just, and then, you know, with anything you can do, I would just take my time. It just frustrated me so much. Like I didn't want to learn. Now I can do it. Once in a while, I'll spend three hours and call them walking home. You know, I don't know what to do. But the worst thing you do is when you start comparing your expectation. I'm almost wearing more money. I got it. That was his hand to speak of. But when the worst thing you do is when you start comparing your expectations with the way life has really turned out, and you start looking at the way life turned out with the way you expected it to. You're setting yourself up for burnout. Once you start comparing, the second thing you start doing is criticizing. Well, first you're comparing and then you're criticizing. You're your own worst critic, people. You tell yourself, I must, I should, I have, I ought, I got. And then when it doesn't happen, you move to phase three, you're feeling guilty about it. Do you ever have so much to do on your to-do list there's no way to get it done? It's impossible. So you just say, forget the list. To be honest. Martin Luther King said this. Everyone should study to be with God an hour a day. And if your day is extra slant, study to be with God three hours a day. I heard that from somebody and it's resonated with me. So that's the second time I have to use that today. I have an iPad, an iPod, an I. Elijah was a man of God, a teacher. 
teacher of the truth, yet he blamed himself for things that weren't his fault. So he's blaming himself, just to this folks, does it sound familiar? He's blaming himself for things he had no control of. It was the death of people what God wanted them to do, but they weren't resting, and the nation was falling apart morally because they had some bad leaders. How many of you take a hint your staff? Co-workers? Family members? Job knocked up on one website. I had to go back and we do your work person's job, and you took the hit for it. They had run in all kinds of paganism. Elijah was taking it for his teaching and preaching, and they weren't changing anything, and he blamed himself as it was his fault. And I know this feeling. I know there have been times I got up to speak, and I know God had told me to say a certain thing, and I've studied and prayed about it, to share something I knew. It could be life-changing, but I knew that 80 or 90 percent of the people would hear it and weren't going to do anything about it. I learned a long time ago that I'm not responsible for your response to my message. And, and I hope that doesn't sound good to me. I'm responsible to simply teach the truth and what God gives me to teach. And my hope and prayer is that it sinks into somebody and it, it changes hearts. I can't take it personally. I was talking to Terry a couple months ago, and sometimes God gives me messages for me, and a lot of times for what's going on here. <laughs> he gives me a message for what's going on here, and that particular year is the year to year. I'm like, wow. The second major cause of burnout is kind of control it. Any control freaks here? Only four of us? <laughs> favors. <laughs> favor, favor, favors. So comparing is number one. Trying to control everything is number two. I heard it called. Has anyone ever heard it called the Atlas Syndrome? Nobody? I think it was class I'm talking about here on day. They called it the Atlas Syndrome. It was a one credit class for and that's when you're acting as a whole world or some choice. A future called it the Atlas. And I have to make sure everything's going to turn out all right. I have to hold everything together. And if it's not going to be this way, it's up to me. And if it doesn't work out, it's my fault. We do the we're setting ourselves up to burn out. We need to quit trying to be the general manager. God's got that. This is a word God never intended for us to carry to people. It's something I'm trying hard to work on personally right now. And I have been for a long time. We've talked about this many times. There's a lot of things in your life that are out of control. You never will be able to control them. We've even talked about this principle that you're not responsible for other people's responses. And it's like, I'm responsible as a parent and my family, but I'm not responsible for every choice my family members make. Right? Yeah. Randy, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Randy's my only stop. He's not going to out. You hear her voice when she is probably. I'm so excited she did baptize today. I should be doing better, and if my kids turn out different than I do, they're, they're adults. Three, we should exaggerate or excavate out our problems when we're heading for a burnout. Here's what we got to do. We have to notice. We have to look around and be able to feel and see all these different patterns that are going on in our lives in the burnout. Instead of saying, I can't make any changes, nothing I can do about stop, drop, and break. And then, in 
Jesus. Out. And then it's me time to say, Lord, my prayer is to stop until I hear from you. Stop, just stop. And if that means a life change, that's what it means. And I mean, what's my favorite response, Jake? I can't. I gotta do it. I can't. This is my wife. I gotta do it. What am I gonna do? I have to. I have to. No, I don't anymore. Last night I said to my wife, no, I don't. We're going to do things that's just a little bit different for this morning. So I'm going to give you a little bit of 
instructions so everybody knows what's going on. Everybody doesn't have to guess what's coming up next. So typically right now we would go into our tech. What we're going to do at this point in time is we're going to fix things up just a little bit. I'm going to start with subscription and then we're going to call those who are going to be baptized up. After that, we'll do communion. And then once we've done communion, instead of Chris and I being on either side and praying, what we'll have you do is we'll have you filter outside for the baptism. And then after the baptism, we'll return and finish up with a little bit of music, okay? All right, so this is some scripture that uh, God gave me this morning as, as I was uh, praying and preparing for uh, service this morning. And this comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. And the, in my Bible, this section, starting at verse 18, it's titled, Christ's Death and Victory. And that's what we're going to be celebrating through baptism today, is Christ's death and His victory, because those who are getting baptized will be symbolizing Christ's death and His victory when they come up out of the water. So this is the words from Peter. Peter says this, Christ suffered for our sins once and for all time. He never sinned, but He died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago, when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat, only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God, and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. Now here's the thing. That water that they're talking about from Noah, it didn't cleanse anybody. What it did, though, was it buoyed, and it was life-saving water for the eight people that God chose to be saved, to carry on. And He has now chosen each one of you. And this morning, those who are being baptized can know that they're chosen. And the water that you will be laid down into and raised up out of will symbolize Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And once we get done with bringing the folks up front, then we will go to the straight into communion. It's what Jesus did on the cross, that death, that burial, and that resurrection, that the meal represents. When we break the bread, it's symbolic of Jesus' body being broken on the cross when he was nailed to the cross. And when he pours the wine into the cup, it symbolizes his blood being shed for you. So this morning, let's have those who are being baptized come
get it out of the way, we're going to start with the light opera. Randy Rose. My life before Christ, I was angry, depressed, and unhappy. I felt alone and used. I always believed in the Lord, the Lord since I was little. I just never prayed or went to church regularly. The day I really accepted Christ in my life was April 17th. I was upset and just dropped my mom off at the airport because my grandpa wasn't doing good. That day I talked to my dad and suggested I come to church. At first I wasn't going to go, but Christ talked to me and told me to go. I felt that he led me here. Since then, I've been extremely happy. I'm going to school, I'm a great mother, and a, and a significant mother. All around a happier, better person with so much joy in my life. Thank you, Lord, for a beautiful family. They are the light of my life. I will continue to, continue to walk down your path and never leave your side just like you never left mine. Amen. Before I gave my life to Christ, I felt all alone. I felt my worldly problems upon my shoulders and didn't know how or where to begin to start working through these. I knew deep in my heart that only God had the solution to these problems. I thought and felt if I was going to grow into something great, this was going to have to be alongside Him. I first received Christ into my life when I was around 10 years old. I attended church and children's Bible study at St. Mark's Methodist Church in Cedar Rapids on a consistent basis for about eight years. The more I learned of God and His salvation for me, the more God began to work in my life, and the more we started talking. Since coming to Christ, I've blossomed into the man we see here today. A great father, a hard and honest working man, a brother in Christ to many, a passionate worship singer and songwriter, a wonderful significant other, a great friend and all-around loving, caring man in Christ. My life verse, not my favorite verse, but my life verse, is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, and plans to give you hope in the future. So to this very day, God has kept his promise to me. God has repaired all that has or was broken in me. God is guiding me as I speak to a renewed future of family, love, and hope. Thank you, Father, for all you have done and all that you are doing in my life to this very day. Awesome. I just wanted to say I did not grow up in the church family. Um, I did not start looking for Christ until I lost both my parents in two years. Um, it was hard to do on my own until I met my husband. He started teaching me the word, and I feel the love, and I totally accept Christ in my life. Awesome. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Thank you. Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. All right. Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you accept Jesus? We are excited. What we're going to do now is communion, and you get to do it first. After communion, for all of those that want to, when we're open to public, we are going to move this to outside. For the actual path. Father God, we thank you for what this prayer represents. And as we send these, these children of yours outside to be baptized, Father, we give all praise, honor, and glory to you. Father, we just thank you for this day and for what it represents for these wonderful children of yours, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were excused, please go outside. We'll meet you out there. Chris, you want to take them out there? Can I have the service come forward, please?
as you can come off for communion, please come down the center aisle, exiting off the side, and come and join us outside for the baptism this morning. Please come forward.
guys watching. Right Thank you. 